stories turn songs into symphonies, events into memories, and lives into legends. In our crowded world, knowing your story cuts through the noise so you can make your mark, whether you want to sell more books, increase profits, or just make a difference. At Sterling & Stone, story is our business. The Story Studio Podcast is where we explore ways we can all tell our stories better. And now, with the Story Studio Podcast number eight, here's Johnny, Sean, and Dave. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Story Studio Podcast. Um, it's probably overdue at this point, but we're, uh, we've are we we've done a lot of episodes about story and story of your business and all this stuff. And um, we haven't actually, we've talked about what story too, but we haven't actually drilled down into like story structure um, without being too, uh, you know, dramatic and nitpicky and, and geeky about it. I think that it, it really would help to understand what, um, like what a, a story structure is. I just found myself thinking about this just today. Um, cause a book I'm reading and I'm realized I'm like, I'm like, I don't, are we in the second act? Like, I don't, I don't even know because it, there isn't a, a real arc there and we'll have to see if the book still works for me even without that. Do you want to say what book it is? Yeah, I will because I do, I do like the book so far, but I'm realizing that there's no like act mark yet or anything like that. Or if there is, it's way the hell into the book. Um, it's the one that you recommended the circle by Dave Eggers. Oh, and yeah. I can't remember. Did you say that there was? You said you saw the movie and you read the book and you felt that one worked and one didn't. Do you remember what it was? Yeah. No. No. I. I. I think they both. I think the the movie didn't work at all. I think the book book should have worked. But what I said um, that the reason that you should read it was because I said they they Realm and Sands did all up. They fucked it up. <laughs> they in made the book it like, or in the in movie. the book in the book. Yeah. And then the movie was just like a really just. Uh, uh, just bland interpretation of it. They just took the most bland approach they possibly could to the material, um, real rote. But the the book itself, I thought had a tremendous amount of potential, but it failed on a structure level. It was basically like 1.0 Realm and Sands is what it reminded me of. Yeah, it, um, and I don't want to pick on this book because again, I, I, I'm, I'm enjoying it so There's a lot I so like far. about it actually. Yeah, I'm enjoying it so far. I'm at, I'm at about 30%, but as we'll, mentioned during this episode by now i would have expected the act one climax i would have expected us to be into act two and there's no clear moment Which there book? uh it's called the circle okay oh yeah okay yeah dave eggers okay. <laughs> correct um so 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 let's talk about this and, and let's try not to delve like i said too deep and get too geeky there are yeah. crazy ways of diagramming structure and actually there was um I Look Some at that Kate I just Morgan's comment because yeah. I think that might be actually a really good place to start. Which is, can we please, <laughs> all in caps, point out that the story structure is not a formula? I think a lot of writers avoid structure due to that misconception and get themselves into a hell of a lot of trouble. Which is absolutely true. It's not. It's not a formula. It's. It's something. It's something that once you understand structure, there is no formula. You can do whatever you want. You can play with the. the it's putty. But understanding that it's like you cannot build a house without structure. You you can't just throw up lumber and like live <laughs> in that. You need structure. And, and story is the same. And if your story meanders, um, it's going to have less read through. It's going to have less people talking about it. It's going to have less people eager for your next story. If it has structure, then you can get away with a lot more. You could, I mean, you could write off the rails if your structure is on the rails. Yeah, actually... Um... Uh, uh, Craig Mason, is that his name? The yeah. st uh, Story Story Grid podcast, one of those those guys. Um, we saw him speak at the Austin Film Festival. And um, script notes. Script notes, sorry. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. So, but that, we saw him speak and he, he did a whole thing on Finding Nemo and I thought it was great, but he started by saying how uh, the, it's it's reverse engineering. It's an autopsy, which is interesting because Matt Champagne in the last episode just said something about an <laughs> right. autopsy. But like most people who diagram stories, it's like, okay, look what I can make this story do when I when I just document its um, its trajectory, rather than starting with this is what because this is the way you don't do it. Starting with this is what a story quote unquote should look like. Now I'm going to make my story conform to it. That's not the right way to do it. It's just that successful stories do tend to have these moments. So I just mentioned the thing about the first act climax, or I don't feel like I'm in act two. And basically at the end of act one, usually 
because they're okay. There are three acts that people usually consider in like traditional story structure. We actually at Sterling and Stone like to think in terms of four acts. But the end that's pretty new for us, but it's actually dramatic. And if you're if you're on our list, then you would have got our our forty sentence outline that Bonnie made and a little tiny explainer video about it. But it's worth taking just a couple of minutes, I think, right now to talk well, about why we yeah went we'll from we'll talk four. about it. But let me finish my thought. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. So the reason at the end of Act One in three or four st- act structure, typically the the hero needs to go on some sort of a journey. Sometimes it's just purely an emotional journey. Sometimes it's a literal journey. It's the moment where things were normal, they got disrupted, and now action needs to be taken. So in Star Wars, when Luke goes off to, you know, join the I, I don't, I, I'm getting, you're going to take away my Star Trek, my Star Wars geek card at this point, but he goes off, you know, he leaves Tatooine, he goes off to fight. The Rebel Alliance. The Rebel Alliance. Sorry. Um, you know, in, in Indiana Jones, uh, uh, the Raiders of the Lost Ark, the first Indiana Jones movie, it's when um, the uh, the tavern burns down and they have the medallion and um, Marion says, uh, you know, I'm going with you, I'm your goddamn partner. And they they have to go off and find the Ark. Uh, so that's usually the moment. And in this book that I'm reading right now, she's just kind of at work and she's dealing with stuff with her parents and she's dealing with stuff. And there's just some creepy shit going on, but there hasn't been a moment. And that's where I'm kind of like scratching my head. Yeah, I read that book and I would totally agree. Uh, so let's break down the the differences between three and four act, but let's maybe begin by talking about three act because it's common and people know it. And then four act is really a very slight variation on three act. It's something you can impose right on top of it. Yeah. One other thing that I just want to say about the, the, the circle particularly, because it's worth noting. I think a lot of people who are listening to this are indie authors. And even though we keep talking about it collapsing between indie publishing and just regular publishing right now, those borders are still there. And a book like the circle um, can sell and can get adapted into a film because it was written by Dave Eggers. Mm-hmm. He already has a name. He has a certain brand. Um, his books he, are going to sell a certain number of units no matter what. If uh, or when Johnny and I have written things that are <laughs> equally meandering with ideas that are just as good, I, I actually think that the circle is similar thematically to, to things that we have done before and not really like we've executed it in the same meandering way, but we're indies. We're algorithmically driven, which means that the, the, the actual readers and also bots are making the determination to whether a book succeeds or not. So if you're an indie author, you have to pay more attention to market conventions than you do if you are a traditionally published author or you already have an established name brand. Those are the two paths to kind of writing whatever you want. Either make it big on the the strength of your own name, which we are seeing a few authors who are transcending that, that their name is big enough to sell whatever. And that's really wonderful to see in this space. But um, it, it's almost like you have to earn that credibility. Yeah. So an interesting story here before we go into a little bit more about structure is Sean's told this a few times, um, the moment where Dave said, I don't understand story structure. <laughs> And yet Dave writes books that have very good story structure. So, really solid story structure. Right. So it's something that is in that is intuitive for certain writers. They may not think that they're really adhering to story structure, but they, they're adhering to the important parts sort of subconsciously or by trial and error or by poking at things until they work, which is, I think, kind of Dave's old method. <laughs> right. And, but that's that's why he'll have to delete, you know, 10,000s worth of words because – he instinctively knows that it's wrong. It's clanging in his ear as he reads it, but he has to poke right in the dark. Understanding the structure means that you have a flashlight. Well, the other half of that is that readers understand structure, whether they know it or not. Um, readers or viewers, if you're talking about a TV show or movie or something like that, they'll know that it's just like, oh, that didn't work, or I didn't love that as much as I could have, and they don't think about it and they can't say why, but it just didn't work. So knowing these things is important if you want to have stories that don't evoke that reaction. So let's talk about um, three-act structure. Just again, I want to keep this kind of loose because you can go into all sorts of nuts and bolts on this sort of thing. You can can subdivide everything into a billion little sections and a billion little subplots, and it does start start to look sort of template-ish. 
And I know that um, when Sean and I saw Robert McKee do his story conference, it was like, okay, now you need to address the change in polarity in this scene from the major value moving from this to this. And I can't think that way. It doesn't work for me. I think that there's a... It sounds a little bit too much like math. It, it right. does. It, it does. It, it, feel, it takes the heart out of it. I, I think it becomes too mathematical. That's my same problem with the, the story grid, which I like the science behind that. And I think it's if you're in that, that phase one of studying... I think it's really an interesting way to break it down, but I think doing that for every book, I don't know. I feel like you you want to learn enough notes to be able to play by touch, and and then kind of leave the sheet music behind a little bit. But that's right. Just me. So so for instance, um, romance is very formulaic. Like I think even romance readers who adore romance would say, that's not derogatory. I think they would agree oh, with no, that. No, no. I, so they would agree with that. It, I mean, it very, very much is. There's, there's, you know, they, they have their meet cute where they meet and it's memorable and they're going to tell their grandchildren this story. You know, there's, there's pushing away and pulling back. And even if you can't, like, you get to intuitively understand that at the end, the hero, the person who's distanced themselves, it's typically the hero, um, like the, the heroine can't just come back to him. Like they broke up and then she comes back. He needs to make some sort of grand gesture. And that, you know, that's missing in a book where you're like, or book or a movie. It's like, oh wait, there was no, there was no grand gesture. She just kind of came back and that feels wrong. Like, okay, they got together in the end, but it just seems off because there wasn't this moment where he had to realize he was wrong. He had to win her back. Um, you know, those are the sorts of things that just become natural once you get rolling. Um, so yeah, so let's talk a little bit about this. Basically, you know, the typical, um, structures is again three acts and act one is everything up until kind of a journey begins it typically takes about 25 percent in most cases of um, a script or a book act three is resolution and everything that happens after sort of an inevitability moment where you can't go back and that typically takes about a quarter of the movie or the or a book and then act two is everything in the middle it's loosely described as where the stuff happens. It's loosely described as um, attempts at, uh, like I, I, the way I like to think of Act Two is a character needs to change throughout an entire story to be satisfying. There should be some internal change for a character. And until they make the change, they're going to proceed with a false belief of the world and a false perception of what will be the proper way to get what they want and so act two is their attempt to get what they want using their old techniques and the way they think that they're going to get it. And they have to change to a new way of receiving what they're actually, what they actually want. Do you think that act two and act three always have to be like a sequel? Does act three always need to act as a sequel to act two or can they behave independently of each other? Uh, give me an example or, um, or, or more well, words to that effect. Well, to, to my mind, the answer is yes. Act three always has to be a, an answer to act two, but not necessarily chronologically. So it could be something like, okay, well, in act three, we're going back. Um, it, although I think this is this is. A, Are you a, saying a, a sequel or like a a cause a causal response? Like, yeah, directly related, right? So whatever happens in C, in in act two. Act three is a direct response to that. Or can you take a pause and just go a different, a, a totally different place that isn't really related to act two and then clean it up in act four? Uh, well, I'm considering an interracial love story through act two and then the resolution is all about robots. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So I, I think that you can go totally left, left field and it could seem like it's not related, but I think no matter what, it has to be related. I uh, think... I, I, I'm just having trouble understanding what you mean. Do you have like a movie example or a book that we could? No, I'm trying to think, but I, but, but I, I think I'm answering my own question in the fact that I can't think of a counter example because even times when I'm thinking of a couple of the, the, the more off the beaten path story structures that we've been playing with internally lately, mm -hmm. and they seem like they go into a really weird place, but it's still directly related to act two. Like even though it, it seems completely off and like Charlie Kaufman does a lot with crazy narratives and, and it goes like, well, why are you doing that thing? But it always pulls back Tom, Paul Thomas Anderson, another one. Um, 
it seems like they're going into these really strange places, but it actually works by the time they get to the end. So I, I think that I answered my own question. Two and three really have to be related, even if they seem unrelated. Uh, yeah, I mean, everything, I, I think that there are two things that come to mind here, and I don't know if they address your your wondering or, or whether they're just kind of semi-related. Um, the first is unrelated to structure, although also integral to structure, is that um, good stories are causally linked. If, if, if a book, I, I read a book a while ago, and I won't name this one, where it was just a bunch of shit that happened. And I thought there was no point to any of this because it's like, if I'll tell <laughs> you later, gone season one. <laughs> event A happened and then event B happened and then event C happened, but you could pull any of them out or you could shift the order. It just kind of didn't matter. Um, Space shuttle. <laughs> there are like, there are movies. I can't think of a good example of a movie or a book where a bunch of stuff happened and it felt, and then you got to the end and it felt like, why did they do any of that? It didn't matter. Like, why was there this big battle? Because it didn't, create stakes for oh for you're reading my autobiography right why did it matter dave yes. why did you do these other 40 years at the beginning of your life um so causal relationships uh yes and two is that there are plenty of plot driven stories where um i'm going to pick on the da vinci code i couldn't give a shit about i've never heard you do that before yeah right um, now that said, I enjoyed the da vinci code like i didn't not like right, the da vinci but you, code you knew what it was when you read it, you you were okay with wallpaper because it was fine. It was entertaining. Right. The characters in a book like that generally, you don't care about them. At least I don't because Robert Langdon, that's his name, right? Yeah. He doesn't change throughout the book. He does, There's no real interesting things with him or the love interest who I've completely forgotten. Um, they're just kind of set piece. They're just kind of pawns. I think her name is Sophie. But who cares, right? I don't know. So, <laughs> I'm shocked that I remember that. They're just like, things need to happen to somebody in this plot-driven story. So how about Robert and Sophie it can be the people these things happen to? We don't care. It could have been Bob and Joanna. It doesn't matter. Um, and so a, a good character, I'm right. sorry. We, all we know about Robert Langdon by the time we're done with that book is his LinkedIn profile. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, you know, good stories are, they tell a series of events but they come about, well, they come about as a result of, of some sort of a character journey or a character journey is reflected in what occurred. So some, whatever occurs. So like, again, back to Star Wars, Luke is changed. Luke has to decide, you know, a lot of things about himself. He's, he starts out very, very selfish and immature and he kind of has to grow up. He has to grow up a lot in order for that, for that movie to work. If it's just like Luke just waves his lightsaber around that doesn't that doesn't uh, all right, change all right. anything. yeah yeah I, I think um ash has a, a a good point here in the the chat that's worth addressing aren't a lot of thrillers like that the protagonist is just someone wading through the plot okay yes shitty thrillers but if you look at the thrillers that actually resonate that like silent silence of the lambs is a classic thriller that we can all agree was both commercially and critically successful became a classic we still revisit that well that's not just a protagonist wading through the events. Um, you know, the Clarice Starling's baggage is directly tied to her protagonist and to, to Hannibal. And it all matters. Everything in that book matters. There's no, there's no point where she is just coasting along through that story. She is reacting to the things that are put her way. And we are watching that. We're suffering through with her. We're hoping when she hopes, we're beaten when she's beaten. Um, seven is another really good example. Uh, I, I mean, I, we don't need to talk about the ending of that movie, <laughs> but like that puts stakes. Like there's, it's really personal that it makes it personal. I, I'm going to back away just a little bit from saying shitty thrillers. I think that there is, um, a place for that. And it is kind of a personal taste that said psychological thrillers, um, you know, thrillers, somebody described, I don't know where I heard this, Sean, maybe you remember um, that a thrill, what you what you want in a thriller, what a reader wants in a thriller, is an experience worse than death. That's story grid. That Sean Coin said that. Okay, so good going, Sean. I would agree. So if you're looking <laughs> for an experience worse than death, then something quote unquote worse than death has to happen to the characters in it, thus making a character journey kind of essential in that sort of a story. So that would be my two cents. Um. We should change the name of Worst Show Ever to Worse Than Death. Just a thought. Oh, oh I, I'm actually I like into that. <laughs> so, um, 
So, uh, so, so let's, let's talk about act one. Um, act one is you, you typically, this is kind of typical people, you know, toss, you know, change these things up all the time, shake them up. Um, memento is something that is tossed around all the time as well. That doesn't follow classic structure. Number but it one, does. It, it totally does. It's it just does. Yeah, it, it does. does. It does. It just doesn't do it chronologically. Yeah. And, and we found that again, we're, we're the, the beautiful thing internally about stories to go is that we get to practice all kinds of outlines and all kinds of different structures and just play with story and with narrative. And I really like messing with structure. It's one of my favorite things to do. And that's what I have found over and over and over again is that you can mess with the structure all you want as long as you don't mess with the structure. Yeah, the, um, the, the, the key waypoints in a film or a book, in a story, tend to be emotional more than literal, if this makes any sense. So, for instance, act one is usually you, you, you show your characters normal. Like, what is life like for them at the beginning? So in Memento... You could argue that, well, that's mid-story that you're starting out, but it is his current normal while he's searching for his wife's killer. And then he's disrupted by this, you know, the arrival of um, Joe Pantoliano's character. I don't remember exactly. But there is this inciting incident where his normal is disrupted. It just happens out of chronological order. Um, And then uh, you look like you're going to say something. No, 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 I'm not. I'm okay. Not. So typically the inciting incident. Um, and one, another thing I'll, I'll tip my hat to Robert McKee on this is he said, I'm going to see if I can remember this. You can help pick me up, Sean. The inciting incident is where you're, the normal is disrupted and the character is kind of forced to, I don't know, um, be off kilter for a bit. And and usually it, it eventually make a change. It's a decision. It's nudging them towards something where, because that's the thing you can't have things just happen to somebody they have to they have to be an active participant in their own story. They have to make decisions. If you have a story where things just keep happening to the character, um, well, you don't have a story. You have somebody who's bobbing in the water, and that's not going to resonate with a reader. And if she finishes your book, good for you. Do you remember <laughs> like, Hulk you shitting all of her Green Lantern for that? <laughs> I remember Hulk shitting over a lot of stuff. Um, that was a really fun, um, Hulk, that was a fun book to Hulk read. Hulk critic. Yes. Yeah. And actually I, I, that's a really great structure book. And the reason it's a great structure book um, is because it's funny. And so humor is great, especially if you don't know that you could go to the midpoint and read it in normal. Right. Text. Okay. So I was going to skip over this, but now that Sean has, you guys are all wondering what the hell he's talking <laughs> about. And this is a big ball buster because the book's not available anymore. So like, we're going to describe a book that's going to sound really great and you can't get it. Um, it's pulled off. I think he probably got a deal. So it's probably like moving through the traditional publishing machine. So he had to pull down his old version, but it was, I think it was called script writing 101 or screenwriting 101. And it was by, by Hulk smash or by Hulk, Hulk crit. crit Hulk, like, like, like Hulk, like the, you know, the incredible Hulk Hulk crit. Cause he's a critic. Um, and he's gotta be somebody connected in Hollywood. Like just has yeah. to be. Yeah. Um, but it's, it is a really good structure book if you can find it. Uh, so anyway, the, the McKee thing that I was mentioning is the inciting incident is I'm going to try to remember how to, he said this it should be as early as possible you know, sufficient that you have, you need to build up enough, uh, sympathy you for the characters such that you need to care, right? The, the, the characters have to be, and, and it can happen fast. I mean, look how look, a lot of times it's fast, on page one, how fast do you care about the characters and up like immediately? And then more and more and more. And then by the time you're at that seven minute mark, they own you. Like you, you really understand. Right. Them, you so. should delay the, the inciting incident no longer than is required to create a sufficient emotional connection. So his counter to this was life is beautiful where the inciting incident, pst, right. spoiler, they get taken away to the concentration camps is like halfway through the movie or something. Right. Yeah. I think the movie is an hour and 45 minutes. And I think the inciting incident happens at the one hour mark, which is crazy. And it, could not work any other way. That movie would fundamentally fail if it had a different structure. Why? Because by the time, like it's it's really sad. You're watching, um, you're watching this. So, th in short, Life Is Beautiful is about this um, th this man who 
well, it's a family. The, the, the man and the wife and their son, Joshua, um, get sent into um, a, a, a concentration camp in the Italian countryside during World War II. And the, the father is just like, beautiful. he has this beautiful spirit and he protects his son by, you know, when the Germans are coming in and they're talking about killing everybody, he's saying, oh, they're coming in to play hide and seek with us. Let's go play hide and seek. And he's just kind of shielding his son from the atrocities. And it's just a beautiful story. But you only know Josh Way for those 45 minutes. Before that, you know the life that, that Roberto Benigni is trying to build. And you see the courtship of him and his beautiful wife and how he tries to win her over. And it's, it's almost like a comedic farce from a different time. The movie came out in 1998, totally doesn't feel like it. It feels like something much, much more vintage than that. It is a handsome movie. It's beautifully crafted. And it has this, just this wonderful, wonderful heart to it. And you care about these people. And then it opens up five years later and he finally won his bride. They got married. It's all like fanfare, you know, this is very dramatic when they get together. And then the very next scene is now they're five years old and oh my goodness, you get to watch the little, little Joshua and it's so beautiful. And then a few minutes later, they're in a train and you're just like, oh, oh my God, you just feel so much pain for them because you know how beautiful it was that they built this thing. And it wouldn't have worked because <clears throat> otherwise it's almost <coughs> a documentary. And of course they can make you feel for people that are in a concentration camp. Many other movies have done that, but this was creating a personal connection first so that it, it hurts more. It re was required to create the connection. The movie. Was this intended. is the most effective um, Holocaust movie I've ever seen for me personally. It's the one that hit me the hardest. Uh, I, I love this movie. It's one of my favorite films of all time. So again, act two in the traditional structure, and we'll talk about why we break this up a little bit is the, the, the character at the beginning, the main character wants something. There's something that they want. Um, the example I gave when I was telling my um, daughter's fourth grade class about this was I actually used the Lego movie. And so Emmett wants to fit in, right? He wants to um, be known and liked. And the way he thinks, so they, they have something they want and they have a way that they think they're going to get it. So in the Lego movie, again, Emmett thinks that he is going to become be fit in and be liked i'm sorry he wants to be liked he wants to be remembered and the way he thinks he's going to get it is by fitting in doing as he's told being part of a team being a team player and so act two is all emmett's attempt to try different ways to get that thing to get what he wants by by doing what he thinks is the right way to do it so he's he thinks he's a special but he's trying to He's trying to fit in. He's trying to be like the other master builders. He's trying to do things that he feels are true to the rules, even in a ruleless group of people. And so that's like the um, you know whole thing with Lego Batman is is part of that. The Cloud Cuckoo Land and the destruction of Cloud Cuckoo Land is part of that. Um, everything that happens in the middle of the movie is that attempt. And then Act Three is where the character is kind of past a point of no return. That this is going to happen. There's going to be this big you know climax. And the character has to change to realize that there's another way to get it. And so ultimately Emmett gets what he wants. He gets remembered by, you know, not being like everybody else, by being unique and being special, which is kind of the emotional core of the Lego movie, be who you are. And then how does that feed directly into the third act of that same movie? Uh, uh, I have forgotten my structure notes on this particularly, but... Um, you know, we get that whole moment where we realize that this has been a fantasy of the kid and I'm um, giving spoilers for the Lego movie and that the whole thing has been kind of an allegory for his, you know, his father who works all the time and wants everything very orderly. And so, um, you know, those characters, it, it really is a change on the part of the, the Will, Will Ferrell character. Well, th yeah, that, that story has a great fourth act twist which would be third act if we're talking three acts which i know is confusing because on that screenplay it would be considered. extra act let's just put it that way another act at the end beyond what we would normally think yeah and and for that one that's where you realize that that reality itself is being manipulated but that works really well in the lego movie because they built the case because they they made you care about Legos of all things. Legos actually a really good example of a movie. I 
I did not expect to like that. I thought it was stupid that they were making it. And then Dave told Dave me. Dave was the was first good. one to, who saw it. I'm not going to yeah. give you spoilers. It, it, gets, yeah, he, it gets the movement. He said it was really good. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> I'm curious then. Because that seemed like a really weird movie for Dave to praise. Although he did just a year later praise Angry Birds. So. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know that there's a really long, cinematically beautiful scene of an eagle <laughs> oh, pissing yeah, in like that? it's like a minute long where the bird just pees for a minute. Yeah. It's hilarious. Interesting side note. Uh, my son loved the Lego movie up until the point where they realized that none of that was real. Oh, well, that's sad. <laughs> that's, that's... Well, I think as a kid, it's a little different. Like you just shatter. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. As I, a father, I, though, it was a very powerful thing. Yeah, no, it was. It's 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 great. It was really great. And I didn't expect to like that movie, but I thought what they did with structure and I thought what they did with uh, the delivery of information and kind of obscuring things. And then at the very end, like the whole, cr- I forget what it's called, but the, the Kraken, the crazy glue or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Like Crackler. that was just... Yeah, right. It was just really awesome. They did. They they made a, a a really excellent movie off a ridiculous premise that is meant to sell toys. It totally should not have worked. Well, they had great writers, and those writers really hit on you know they have great uh, humor writing chops, and they hit on cultural uh, touchstones. I think a lot of us can identify with. And they're writing the Han Solo movie. Yeah, I, I have no doubt they'll do good. <laughs> the important thing to remember is that a good structure has an up and down sort of rhythm to it. So right before, there are several like all is lost moments. There's there, there's one that's kind of right before act three typically. And um, again, we're using three act with this will change a little when we start talking about four act. But right before the big climax, there needs to be this moment where it's like, this shit is not going to work. This is not going to work. Everybody's going to die. Start looking for it in movies and books the movies that are best have this. The ones that fall flat, it's because the trajectory is too even. There's no down before the up. Um, in romances, they call it the dark night of the soul. It's where the characters realize that they really fucked up. They're supposed to be together. And, you know, it's it, the, the hero and the heroine are both like, oh, my God, it was so much better when we were together. Now it's all over. And you have to believe on some level, even though an intelligent movie goer and reader sees through this. But on some level, you have to be like, it's over. There's no way. There's no way this could possibly be redeemed. And then you have the up. But if you have a movie that's just kind of an even keel, then it doesn't satisfy you. On You need those emotional ups and downs. Um, okay, so let's go into th- to four act, but I want to just... I want to just, just so everybody's engaged so here. So act is normally the third act, correct? Well, no, no, no. Hold on. So let me let me lay the groundscape because you, when you mentioned the that movie has a fourth act, like that is a little disorienting. It's true, but it it's probably going to confuse the verbiage. So if we're talking about three acts, again, the first act is set up and it ends in a point of the character deciding to go on a journey. In good stories, the character does decide to go on the journey, by the way. If the character is dragged on the journey... Not nearly as satisfying. Um, And then act two ends when there's this point of inevitability and it's just, you're gonna, you can't get away from, you know, going toward the the climax of that story. So in Raiders of the Lost Ark, it's kind of when um, India is aiming the rocket launcher at the Ark and then Belloc steps away and says, okay, blow it up. And he calls his bluff. And then they, you know, they're like, okay, well, clearly he's not gonna blow up the Ark. That's the act two climax. And then it goes on until the end and re- resolving action at the end. But what we've started using more and more, we think in terms of four acts because we basically split act two into two parts. So it's act one, then act two, three, and then what used to be act three, we're, we, we would call act four. Do you want to either of you talk about why we do that? Because I've been talking a lot. Well, I, I mean, I think that kind of evolved where <laughs> we were... I found it much easier to think in terms of 25% of the story, 25% of the story, 25% of the story, especially once I... And then 25% of the story. Did I miss that 25 Yeah, you only said three of them. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Well, there needs to be four of those. And so um, it was divided evenly. And then I don't remember what happened first, the four acts or the 40 sentences, but they were about the same time. And... I, it just seemed very easy to group it. Okay, I need 10 sentences for the first chunk of the story, 10 sentences for the second chunk, and on and on. And so um, when, once we started uh, working with our other outliners, um, 
for stories to go. Some of them were using three acts and it seemed like most of them very quickly moved over to four acts because when you're outlining, it is just for me and it seems like a lot of our outliners, it, it is easier to break things down into fourths because as the story evolves, you can change it, right? So you'll add, you know, instead of maybe that first 10 paragraphs or scenes or chapters or whatever you have, eight or 12 or 14, it doesn't matter. And then two and three, those numbers are, are soft. You add scenes, you subtract scenes, you expand, but it's really beneficial just on a, I don't know, on an efficiency level to kind of have a baseline that you're starting from. And uh, the 40 chapters really works for my 40 brain. sentences. Oh, 40 chapters. Sorry. Yeah. It's, a, it's the same thing. Like it starts with 40 sentences. It goes to 40 paragraphs, ends up 40 chapters, um, you know, as an outline, but then, as you individualize that, that could be 30 chapters, it could be 100 chapters, it doesn't matter. But the idea is that, that you have that root and dividing it into four acts just made it way easier to see the whole story and then see how the four pieces relate to each other. Because ideally, when you have really great story structure, you want the first act to kind of mirror the last act in some ways. And you, you want, want the, callbacks there. Right. And you want the second act and the third act to really work together. And you want all four of them to work together. And if you can see it in fours instead of threes, again, for me, your mileage may vary. It's It's been a, it's been a much better way for me to approach story. Um, and again, for those people who think that putting a lot of fences around your work limits your creativity, I just could not disagree with that any more than I do. I feel like the more, okay, here's what you have to work with, the more the ideas can can really blossom. And we've had amazing ideas based on a cover or 40 sentences that go crazy, crazy places. It's how deep you dig into those ideas. I find it more freeing, some yeah. of the limitations, because it it's like, it's a difference between looking at ingredients in a blank table, really. Yeah. This, this is what I have to work with. That's exactly it, dude. Yeah. Um. Just a note on that that mirroring thing. I can't think of any examples off the top of my head, but if you start to look at a lot of really good stories, what will happen is a character will make a choice or react to a situation in Act 1 at the beginning, um, very near the beginning of the movie or book, in one way, <clears throat> and that's using their old paradigm. That's their old belief system. That's them believing they are a certain way, that um, they need to be a certain way to succeed in life, that um, they're going to get what they want by being that way. And then you'll see the same choice, not with the same people, but a, a similar choice. So I'm making this up, but let's say it's an old miser and an orphan kid comes up and asks for money and he says, fuck off, you know, in, I've in, seen that movie, right? You know, you see that in, in, in one, in act one, <clears throat> but then in, in the final act, he might be confronted by a different orphan and respond with generosity. So, because something has changed, they, they are responding with their new belief system. Um, actually, you know, A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, which is what I think of with the miser and orphans for some reason, is actually... <laughs> Why would you think that? A really clear example of a character being forced to change, a character deciding to change, being nudged to change personally because of external events and an arc like that. It's kind of... Yeah, a, that's one of the best examples in literature. Right. Um, so the, the, just to... Uh, the reason that we separate three and four, because Sean was giving it for manners, uh, uh, matters of utility. Like it makes sense to think in terms of 25, 25, 25, 25. Um, but a lot of people talk about the, the soggy middle or whatever that is, the act two doldrums, where you're trying to get through all this, quote unquote, the stuff that happens. And it's kind of this undifferentiated mess that takes up typically about half of any story. And so it's tricky to get to maneuver that for a lot of people. Like that's something you hear a lot. And in bad movies, you'll feel it in a theater. Like, oh my God, is this ever going to end? Um, so credit to Robert McKee on this. I don't know that this is like his idea or anything, but he was talking about this when we saw him. And he said, because of that, because there's this long slog between the exciting end of the first act and the exciting end of the second act, they, they've started, like Hollywood started talking about a mid-act climax in um, act two. Which sounds suspiciously like an extra act to me. <laughs> exactly. Acts are marked by an exciting, like an up moment, a moment where, where something exciting happens, where they're, you know, they're going on the journey, they're, they're defeating evil, or they're, they're rising from the ashes. And so 
to put something exciting in the middle to boost it as a quote unquote mid act climax is really just to divide the middle act into two acts. Yeah. And I think just the economy of like your, your flow and being able to tell a story if like, like, okay, so everything that I edit and polish that comes into two, at least two passes, right. An edit and a polish, but I don't call that like my editing time because that sounds really daunting. Like, Oh my God, editing. I'm going to have to go through it twice. That's terrible. I'm thinking of it as two separate tasks, which makes it more manageable in my head. You know, one is this and one is that. And the act structure, making it four is the same way. I don't have this big giant thing that it's really hard to see around. Instead, I have two distinct things that are each their own stories that have to play together. So thinking of I have four stories to tell is just much easier for me than I have two short stories and a long story make them work. Yeah, Kate just mentioned in the comments that um, that the the what I was calling the mid act climax in Act Two, or the the this two act climax in a four act structure, basically at the halfway point of a story. She said you're talking about midpoint um, where everything it's where everything changes, and I hadn't thought of it in those terms, but that does feel true on first gasp. Um, in the Lego Movie, I know this is one because I pulled this out as well when I was talking to my daughter's school. Is the battle for Cloud Cuckoo Land is basically that. It's the mid-act climax for, um, it's the middle of the movie. And you'll notice that in good, well-paced stories that there is something exciting that happens right around the middle. But when you think about like, what is that battle in, again, the Lego movie? Like that is an emotional reflection point where the the, um, the builders kind of run their world even though they're rebels. But this is where they kept, you know, the Lord Business's army caught up to him. And it is <laughs> another- business. For large business. I forget how awesome the names are in that show. <laughs> right. So, but that is a moment and it's a moment for Emmett where he kind of realizes yet again that he's, he's not, he's, I think that's when they kind of all really, really, really get that he shouldn't be the special, I think is around that moment as well. Um, you know, he lets everybody down. So it is kind of a point where everything changes. And Unikitty. And Unikitty. Yes. Has anybody seen the Unikitty show on Cartoon Network? It's not good. <laughs> oh my God. No. Haley showed it to me yesterday and like she's like, Oh my God, Dad, you have to see how terrible this is. She's like, however bad you think it's gonna be, it's gonna be worse. And she was so right. It's just I cannot believe that they're spending money to make that extra. They've ruined a good character. Yeah, it's just the worst. <laughs> Uh, what else do we want to say about story and story structure? Is there anything? I mean, I'm well, sure there I, I, is. The, the only thing that I would really add to this is that, well, okay, I got two things. The first is that it's just practice. It's something you're never going to be too good at story structure. You're never going to be good too good at telling stories. Practice outlines, it's been, it's, it's been wonderful for me. I really, really enjoy it. It's an exercise that we're all doing internally. And uh, just practicing telling the story is different than, than writing a story. Um, and, and the more you do that, the, the sharper you're going to get. And the other thing that I would add that's just kind of super important <laughs> is um, it's a guide. You know, don't, don't get bogged down at all. Um, know the rules so that you can break them because they're really fun to break. And uh, once you have them internalized, once you've practiced, throw the rule book away. You know it, you understand it, you've internalized the stuff, and just go tell your stories. Do not let this handcuff you at all. Um, I will add one little extra thing that Sean did basically say, and it's kind of a structure thing, but it's really more just kind of a, a character thing. Um, and Sean, you did kind of say this, but I want to really ram it home. It's that your character needs to be making these decisions. They can't be pulled along willy-nilly. So I'm thinking of, um, we, we had a, we have a book called The Dream Engine, and we were in the fi we were actually writing that live under a deadline, like with people watching us. And I remember, like right at the time, right before I was going to write the climactic scene, I um, emailed Sean and said, uh, "You know what? I I wonder if our ending works because it just kind of rises. It's like she battles, 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 gets through the thing, battles, battles, and then and then the story, you know, ends. And I was like, but she's not." really having to face anything. Like she's not, there's nothing that she's having to overcome. She's, the things are happening to her and she just kind of has to get through them rather than, okay, I have this moment where I can turn and face my fear. I can turn and battle the foe through volition rather than through being forced. And we had to change on the fly that day 
the whole ending of the book because it wouldn't have been satisfying to just have a bunch of shit happen to her, which she successfully parried away. Yeah, you don't want to make a promise either, you know, implicit or explicit to your reader and then not deliver it. That's pretty much the worst thing you can do as a writer, whether you're writing sales copy or fiction. Like that's, you just, you can't do that. If you promise something with your title, with your opening paragraph, whatever it is, uh, with the clues that you leave throughout the book, um, with the structure that you have in place, and then you fail to deliver that, that's just not a happy reader. All right. So I'm sure there's a lot more to say about this. This is the Story Studio podcast, and therefore I'm sure we're going to come back to a lot of this stuff as um, dissecting and drilling further in. Um, for those of you out there listening, please let us know if you're interested in these topics and you want to, you want us to delve deeper on anything, um, help at sterlingandstone.net, just email. Or um, we started, we successfully got on Facebook Live with this show Yay. after a few after a few false starts. So um, we will be on Facebook Live most hopefully Fridays at 2.15 Central Time um, on the Story Studio podcast page. So you can just interact there and leave comments and stuff. Um, just let us know. And um, the oh, uh, the next episode we're going to talk about, um, we're going to pick three of our past successes and failures and just dissect like what we would do differently. Like what have we learned try to explain to you guys why we made the decisions then and why we would make them now in terms of story. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to mention is that uh, <clears throat> we're our insider group right now is opening up uh, and it's going to be closing very soon after this airs. So I just want to let you guys know if nobody, if you don't care at all about the stone table, just skip on out. But I just wanted to mention that um, sterlingandstone.net slash table, um, we'll be accepting new people for that. It's a very small group um, for the next year. And anything to add, Sean? Um, no, um, I would love to see as many of you there as we have room for. And it's a great, great, great group and an amazing year. And that's all I got. Dave, anything to add in general? It doesn't need to be about uh, Stone Table or anything. Um, no. No? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing at all. You're a fountain, my friend. <laughs> he really is. The fountain? That's about Dave. <laughs> All right. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for listening to the Story Studio podcast. And we will see you next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Story Studio podcast. If you're ready to take the next step in your business, 2018 could be your year. Our insiders group, the Stone Table Mastermind, is open for registrations, but only until March 31st. Learn more about the Stone Table at sterlingandstone.net slash table.